Good evening, everybody who, is that loud enough? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, everybody who ventured out on this gorgeous afternoon, I uh, was just saying to Greg, you know, we're, we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. If the weather's bad, nobody comes. And if the weather's too good, nobody comes. We're like farmers that were weather dependent in the opposite way. Anyway, um, welcome. I'm Liza Bernard, as most of you know. And um, I'm the programming librarian here at Norman Williams Library now. And I just want to remind you all to turn off your cell phones and other distracting devices. Um, I. Uh, want to thank WCTV for filming this and many, many of our events. You can find them in a week or so on their website and on our website if you want to go back through and see what you sounded like as poets or how other people have sounded or share with your friends. And I want to mention a couple of things. We still have um, the Recite group on second Tuesdays at 5.30. And it's a group where people come and share poetry, their own, somebody else's. It initially was pure recite, and you were supposed to memorize it, but that has clearly fallen by the wayside. So it's basically an open mic night, and it's very informal. And um, uh, we welcome newcomers, please. Um, and the other thing I, I do need to mention, and that is we have uh, Norman Williams Public Library Summer Book Bingo. and. Um, you can choose a book and cross off a square. And one of the books, I, one I, I won, I don't know which direction you say it is, is a book of poetry. So you can get a head start this evening. So our format is going to be very simple. I'm going to do brief introductions. Poets will do a reading. And um, if possible, there will be book signing and, and uh, visiting afterwards. So the Pi Poets, as I understand it, took their name from their first collaboration, which was published in 2014, which was entitled Perhaps It Was the Pi. And that book also featured Marjorie Matthews, who is now focused on fiction. Um, all of the poets published in the party cabinet live in the region. And they've been working together uh, since taking a write writing workshop together more than a dozen years ago. They each have had poems appear in various well-respected publications, so I'm not going to go through the list for everybody. But I am going to um, introduce them in alphabetical order. Um, Ina Anderson lives in South Royalton now, but was born and raised in England. She's worked as an editor and taught writing and literature at Vermont State Colleges. And her first solo collection, A Journey Into Space, came out in 2017, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Doreen Ballard, who lives closest by in uh, South Woodstock, is a retired special education teacher. And she's been writing since childhood and published essays and poems. Beverly Breen is the pen name of retire, retired English teacher Beverly Barton. She hails from Thetford and has been writing poetry on and off for years. Debbie Fr Franzoni now lives the furthest afield in Castleton and began writing poetry when she retired from teaching back in 2008, and she's active in several writers groups. And Hatsy McGraw, a retired school librarian, lives in Heartland and has been writing poetry for more than three decades. In 2004, she won the Robert Penn Warren Prize for free verse. And I also need to know uh, the cover image of the book. It was painted by Tom McGraw, Hatsy's husband, and his work has been shown around the region, including locally at Ava and Artistry. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone over to the poets. Can you hear me? Thank you to those of you who came. Um, I'm just I'm very grateful to have been part of this group for such a long time. It's this wonderful group of women and poets and friends. Of, so I just wanted to say that it's been a good, how many years? Over a dozen years. It's been good writing together and working together and playing a little bit together. <laughs> um, I was, uh, my, my poem that I'm going to read right now is the title of the book. The Party Cabinet. The pine door with a vertical crack in it hasn't been open in 17 months. Its contents were almost forgotten until the invitation came 
to join a group of friends. As I grab the handle and slowly open, I see a thin blanket of dust has drifted in through the crack. Reaching in, I pull out a conical hat with rubber band to stretch under the chin, a scarf of rainbow colors, streamers and noisemakers hear the crackle of their unfurling tongues. Looking further into the dark space, I see a gleam of a smile, dimpled creases stretching wide. From some deeper corner, I hear laughter and voices singing. I pull everything out, place it in a circle on the floor, which cheers me, pushes aside my anxieties, fears. I stand and look toward the windows, see the line of maple trees against a blue sky, branches lit by the sun. Outside, hummingbirds zoom, monarch butterflies feed on Mexican sunflowers. There are so many reasons to have a party. Um, the second one I'm going to read, um, I have uh, identical triplet granddaughters in uh, California who just turned five, and this is a memory. Hope in small packages. My son cups one daughter's face in his palm, moves down the row of three high chairs, kisses each soft-haired head in turn. Today, he will ready the wagon for a walk to the park, but the air meter beeps as the wind changes. Black, papery flecks of ash from hill fires fall, dissolve in the pool water. He closes windows, turns on purifiers, this is not what he envisioned on the day his triplet girls were born. A plague of fires, air unsafe to breathe, a pandemic out of control. He lifts each girl to the floor, let loose, they run in three directions. In the playroom, he opens the door to the book cabinet, empties a basket of toys on the floor. Shrieks and giggles of joy reach him from the next room. Val has pulled the long window drapes around her. Ev and Elle snatch them open, then close them again and again, a raucous game of peekaboo. And just like that, the air clears. Uh, my third poem tonight is called Preparing for Winter. The old man walks in the garden, moves to one plant, stop to another stop. So go his steps. He passes the dying asparagus ferns, makes a note. He will have to cut them to ground level, cart away the debris. Maybe tomorrow. Today he leans down, pulls a few carrots, beets that never matured, many weeds to contend with. He promised her before she left, he would clean out her garden ahead of the winter snows. Removing plants, digging roots, creates mounds of soft soil. He wants to lie down there, soak in the warmth of the late autumn sun. Instead, he heads for the gate, giving himself a mental poke. Check the freezer, root cellar, the food she started to put away for winter. See if there is enough for one. And the last poem I'm going to share tonight is, uh, is one about my mother. Wild creatures welcome her home. The day is hot and sunny. We stand upwind on the lee. Our quiet rendition of amazing grace drifts with the puffs of ashes. One yellow butterfly flits among us. Mum's favorite color was yellow. She used to seek out black-eyed Susans and yellow-centered daisies. Walking back, we crisscross the open field, left to milkweed, meals for caterpillars, stems for bright green cocoons to hang upon. A shifting movement of orange rises up, flapping wings of a new generation of monarchs. Back at the house, we heat the grill for kebabs. At the upper edge of the yard, a black shape moves its thick, glossy coat shining in the underbrush. Dark eyes gleam, brown muzzle points up. The short tail on its wide rump is the last part to disappear into the woods. 
On the rise of the hill, another dark shape appears. A large tom turkey fans out his feathers, a warning to stay away from his harem and a dozen rambling chicks. While we visit and eat, a whizzing, chirping, ruckus sleep sweeps around us. Hummingbirds argue about who can drink from feeders, and the rose of Sharon's blossomed. With all the sky to fly, two hawks soar in circles, usher in the dust's pink tinted clouds, closing out a sweet gift of a day. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce Beverly Breen. We'll see if I can jinx the mic. Is that working? Okay. I have a difficult relationship with technological t things. They, they uh, stop working for me. Okay. Um, I too am just blessed by being part of this writing group um, and I thank them very much for being my friends, my co-writers. Um, as I'm reading tonight, I'm going to move from darker poems toward lighter ones. Um, when very often one of the reasons that I write has to do with trying to wrap my head around feelings. And sometimes feelings come from um, circumstances, circumstances that don't seem to support those feelings. And um, th that's sort of a mystery to me. This poem is called Shadows. One, the wider life of day draws close, time to come home, toss aside the mail, feed the mewling cat. Why tears for which I have no reason? Two, late afternoons my mother, who is never still, lies across her bed. Tides of sadness wash the walls between the leaving light and tasks ahead, her own grief or her mother's. Three, as evening looms, the farmer's wife pauses as she peels potatoes, wonders what mood he will carry from field and thought barn to shade their evening meal, color the family night, black and blue again, And the second poem comes from, I know the source of the feelings for this one. Um, it's called The Building is Empty. On the landing between stairways, centered between pain and screen, like a mashed date, a brown bat clings. A brown bat clings like a mashed date. White spider webs shroud crumpled wings. I tap the glass in mourning. White spider webs shroud crumpled wings. I tap the glass in mourning. It gapes pink maw behind needle fangs. Mouth stretches in silent cat-like hiss. Mouth stretched in silent cat-like hiss. Behind needle fangs, it gapes pink maw. The building is empty. Starvation is a lingering death. Starvation is a lingering death. The building is empty, the bat and I alone. I ease the pain upward, topple screen to a flat green roof below. On the flat green roof below, the web-freed bat lies, still wings outstretched, perhaps to catch the air of falling. One gulp away, a fly lazes, ants crawl, bee searches, a puddle glimmers. Wings still outstretched, perhaps to catch the air of falling, the web-freed bat lies. Stunned or dead, I do not know, but I dared a week of shots to raise the glass between us. Okay. Um, a little bit of ancient history might be helpful here. Um, in the ancient times, uh, sheep would have, uh, would have been grazed on hillsides uh, during the day, and at night they would have been collected back to a stone enclosure, and the shepherd would have slept right in the gate of that enclosure to, uh, to protect the sheep. 
Sheep in Spring is a persona poem, so I'm writing in the, in, within a, a, a person or object. Sheep in Spring. Weighed down by wet wool, I tread a beaten path where last fall's crop of matted leaves disguises still soft muck below my feet. I seek a dappled patch of teasing sun, a scent, such newness promised by each gust. My herdmates jostle, crowd, resent stone safety of our fold. Gnarled mats of twig-bound fleece, fat tick behind my ear, begin to itch like sin. The shepherd rises from the gate, shakes off the last of sleep, lifts horn to lips, and the last poem I think is the easiest to follow. Um, I, there are certain lines and phrases sometimes of, from poetry that sort of just remain in my head, and um, there were certain lines of Grace Paley's which I'm going to read in a, in a, in a moment um, that I sort of st stuck in my head and I remembered them. I looked up the poem that they come from and there were actually more words in between. But the epigraph that I've written down has ellipses that you cannot see uh, as you hear Grace Paley's quote. I was going to write a poem. I made a pie instead. Everybody will like this pie. This does not happen with poems. That was from Grace Paley from the Poet's Occasional Alternative. The poem is called Save a Piece for Grace. When the first branch of maple blushes pink gold, find a farm stand, search for local peaches. Choose downy fruit suffused with rose, a faint give in your palm. Select eight for baking, extras for the snacking bowl. At home, wash and slice the fruit. Add sugar, half brown, half white, flour for thickening, cinnamon, and a dash of salt. In a large mixing bowl, strew a teaspoon of salt over flour. With push and twist of wrist, cut in shortening, or better, lard. Sprinkle a spoonful at a time, ice cold water, or maybe vodka fluffing flour and fat with a fork till dough forms a ball to roll for crust. Your sugared peaches waiting have formed a golden syrup, pour into bottom crust, cleaning the bowl with spatula's tongue. Tuck down odd peaks of fruit, dot with shavings of butter. Roll dough, cut strips and weave a lattice top to let the juices show. Bake until the pastry browns and molten fruit lava bubbles through the woven crust. Thank you. Our next reader is Hatsy McGraw. Is that good enough? Can you hear me? Good. Um, I too am honored to be working with and writing with these wonderful women um, and have been honored for a number of years. Um, it's also just plain fun that I really look forward to. I look forward to being with them. Um, I also want to thank Liza and Norman Williams Public Library for hosting this gathering tonight. Um, it's always fun to be able to get a little outside of your usual um, place to go somewhere new and, um, and read. So my first poem is called Epiphany, and um, it was inspired by a piano concert by Brad Meldow that was at the Hop some um, years ago. Um, so there, there is a little introduction of um, lines from Neil Young because he did improvise on some Neil Young songs that night. So those are, don't let it bring you down, it's only castles burning, find someone who's turning and you will come around. 
one. And so I saw the world in the sharpness of light, blue moving water, water by the beach, water against this or that green shore. I knew after family cabins, stick style houses, beds made up in quilts, rooms lined with pine paneling, that this was the bay and I was on my way to the other shore. The way the sun shone over the water, the exuberance of seabird calls and the brightness of the place, surely I was in some promised land. Two, we got separated, my husband and I. I stro strolled the rolling streets, peered in windows, felt I had been here. I owned this place from another time. <coughs> And there was a moment when I turned around inside myself and said, I'm still here. I entered an arcade, seduced by sparkling dresses, hesitated. I saw him coming toward me, my husband. Saw him through a large glass door. He waved his arms, did a little dance for our reunion. A stranger spied the signal and began to sing, hey ho, nobody home. A second man joined in, and soon it became a four-part round. Three. And then there were quilts, maybe from that little store, and I wondered, could these men be homeless? Because my friend said, when she went to California, there were lots of, sorry, there were lots of homeless people by the road, and there were two quilts, not enough to go around. We gave the men the quilts, one red, the other pink, spotted with gray marching elephants. Four. And now the sun shines even in New England, although the yard is littered with limbs, broken arms and legs of winter. We'll drag them into a neat pile, then load it in a pickup truck. One spark and it will come alive, fuel for a bonfire to celebrate the summer season. We fed the cat his medicine, California orange flavor, sure to cure all ills. And I, I have no reason to complain. After all, spring has come again. For my second poem, I'm going to read one that I believe came from a workshop that I did with Tom Househalter um, at Ava Gallery. It is called Dancer. Today, I fed my letters, love letters, to the shredder. My handprints, impressions of my gap tooth smile, I cast in brass. You'll find them embedded in the brick walk by the Union Oyster House. There, I suck sweet meat from briny shells and end up with a mouth of pearls. None of this takes any nerve. There's not a fleck of worry on my brow. I am the best dancer around. See, flowers fly at my heels. No time for sentimentality or indecision. I am the butter about to form in the churn. I am the bird's beak right before the chirp. I am near the resolution of the cord. I'm sure you recognize my neck in the unfurling fern. And now for something a little bit different. Um, this is a prose poem and I've started writing prose poems. This is the first one that I did. I have a few more since. Um, I don't know whether a prose poem <coughs> and flash fiction are the same thing, but um, it's, it's a little bit of a story. It's called Herringbone. He left his keys on the train, so when he disembarked at Darien, he had no access to his Volvo SUV and his cell phone, alas, an older version of Smart, had a dead battery. The train was late, the later train he'd taken because of the drink, the few extra drinks, he'd taken with his boss and his boss's secretary, who was new and young, and the reason he'd left his keys next to his empty martini glass, not on the train. No colleagues commuted this late, 
no one to beg for a ride, so he'd have to walk the mile and a half home. As he walked, his footsteps, those of his expensive tassel loafers, beat out a tune. McTavish is dead and his brother don't know, and his brother is dead and McTavish don't know. Yet he knew his brother was anything but dead. In fact, his brother, predictably this Friday night, warmed the third stool from the left at a bar in Jersey, the Lone Star Bar, not an apt name, but decent drinks, while making a pass at a waitress. She was ripped and may have been gay, but there was no sure way to tell just yet. And by the way, maybe never, because he was pretty wasted. His footsteps, the wasted guy who had left his keys somewhere, made a silly pattern with his footprints in those soggy tassel loafers, the motif opposing angles like the herringbone of his woolen jacket. All at once, he visualized the bones of an actual herring, and he felt he knew where the pattern had come from and how everything in life was connected, the fish and the wool of his coat, his brother and himself, McTavish and his brother, life and death. At that moment, he reached his front door, fished his keys from his pocket, and let himself in. <laughs> and the last one is um, a very short poem called The Truth. Here is what I can do when you are not looking spit fireflies from the screened porch to the farthest post on the neighbor's fence. Cook a pot of jam so rich and red when it crystallizes, it's spiked with rubies. Call down finches from high branches to perch on my outstretched arms. Sing all of Beethoven's ninth backward while holding my breath. Hang a spoon from my nose while running a marathon barefoot. Here's what I can do when you are looking. All of these things, only much faster. <laughs> Thank you. And our next reader is Ina Anderson. Height will do me well. just great. <laughs> no, it's great. Hello, everybody. Um, I have to repeat what we've all been saying. What would we do without us pies? Uh, they've become such an important fixture for fun, for pro producing poems, for uh, just feeling good, grateful. Um, I'm going to begin with a poem that's about my childhood, which a lot of my poems in the past have been about. Um, that means in England. This one is called To Encounter the Hedgehog. When I rode Stan's little Shetland stallion, I always found the hedgehog. I, I came to expect it, but lots of other things had to be in place. Stan's petrol tins lined up neatly along his wall, his wife serving tripe in the blue dish, not the gold. So the night the poacher came to my house, Live salmon gasping in his wellies, eyes bulging in supplication for bubbling, gurgling mercy. I was wary of paying out the customary five shillings from my mother's purse, wary I'd break the cantrip, spoil the magic, and never meet my prickly friend again. No stiff, no sniffling, no sharing breath. Never a chance to lie down nose to nose, even for just a moment, joining in its world of insects and squigglers and occasional milk. It was Stan's suggestion that saved me. 
Stan, as he hacked again and again at the stump of an apple tree by the hen house to make way for the new white pony, son of his stallion. Stan, who always gave away an old petrol tin if he acquired a new one, so the line along his wall didn't get rumply. Stan, who brought his cloth cap to my mother to mend for him regularly every autumn. Child, he said to me, bring it kitten treats. They have them at the post office. It can't resist them, and it'll eat them out of your hand. My pocket money was just enough. That night, I lay in the damp grass, nose to nose again with the hedgehog. True. In Vermont now. Just a feel-good poem. And it has an epigraph by Federico Garcia Lorcas. That it says, Lorcas says, the night became intimate like a little plaza. And the poem is called On the Hill. The night becomes intimate like a little plaza the minute it drops upon us. Here, behind the house, the usual gang that satisfied feeling after a rowdy round of bocce. We gather close now on makeshift seats around the settling fire in its old stone frame. Silence for a minute, offers of fill-ups, glasses tinkling, feet outstretched to the heat. The stars join us, not crowding in, just carrying on their own conversations. A breeze whistles the trees, enough to keep the bugs at bay. We know we have a feast to share. Inside the table is already laden. But for now, we linger, thankful for all we have here together on the hill. This next poem, I feel I have to say, is not autobiographical. Where it came from, I'm not quite sure. But I feel I need to say that before I read it. It's called Golden. Surely not the big anniversary already. She laughs and makes a note to book a table. Her mind spins back so many years, Vermont woods in bear season, when he was out for trophy. She feels a rueful twinge of her old anger, her loud theories on bear habitat, her exasperation at needing to curtail her forest walk so many weeks each year. Now she sees him again, rising from his hide, up in the old beach, stretching his arms like enough already, working his stiff legs down the ladder to the thin scatter of snow. And she sees again that grisly hunk of a man, that porcupine in old wool, that creature who suppresses his smell so as not to warn that man of mild mindfulness for hours up a tree in Buddha silence, that son of man with a slim volume of Nietzsche tucked into his breast pocket. She picks up her phone and thinks, gourmet. <laughs> and last, I do like to lie on my back in, when the weather cooperates and look up at clouds. I have a thing about them. And uh, I have a special little poetry porch at home where I can look out at mostly sky and it's clouds I like to watch. 
This poem is called Clouds. I put blankets in the sky and call them clouds. White blankets, I say. Gray blankets, fluffy blankets, flapping. Then, no, I say. That's small change. That's child's play. That's easy pickings. High in the sky, I put red plaid blankets, street maps of navy blue and green, stiff blankets rescued moldy from damp trunks in forgotten attics. Clouds, you say? Clouds can't be that way, even for a poet. Clouds must be thunderous, ominous, cumulus. Clouds must be portentous, woolly, or fluffy. Clouds must be like clouds. And I lie down in the long grass and gaze up in rebellion at fire trucks, armchairs, and mating dogs. <laughs> Thank you. And the last but not least of us is Debbie Franzoni. Hello. Well, I, out of the entire group, have probably learned the most from these amazing women. And the biggest thing I learned is this. Don't start every poem you read with an excuse. <laughs> so this one, uh, I, did, I did find, I, it was a prompt. I was driving down a street and saw leaning against the door at a house a um, bouquet of tulips. Really, there are, it's called. So many ways to show love. The cat curling into a ball on a lap. Coffee at the local spot, a smile. A bouquet of red tulips waiting outside a door. All the ways so small, easy to pass by. A tree leaning on another. And um, after I retired, I uh, was still living in the same town while my husband was finishing up work. And I, um, so I took a, a job of substituting at the school, actually, a thing I promised when I walked out the door I would never do, but I did. So this is what happened one day in a second grade classroom, and it's called The Lesson. The teachers instruct the second grade children to begin their landscape by first painting the whole piece of paper, the color of the sky. Because, she says, everything above the earth is sky. They bend over the task, their brushes washing their papers with paint in shades of blue, pink, and one in orange, while I, the other adult in the room, wonders which children will realize that if the sky begins, where their feet meet the earth, they won't have to climb a tree to touch it. The truth is, I never knew the sky touched the earth. Things you learn in second grade. When we retired out to uh, Lake Bomazine, which is where we live, in case you don't know, uh, two people here might not know, that it's the largest lake inside Vermont. And, uh, but we lived next door to a uh, men's ice hockey coach, and he and I would sit around the fire, campfire late at night watching the stars, and he would tell me his stories of being a professional ice hockey player. And I couldn't believe half of them, but this one is called His, si His Silence, and it's for Terry. In the locker room, alone at the far end, he studies his swollen foot 
blackened toes, nails cut past the cuticles, one ingrown. He grimaces when he shoves his foot into the skate, open wide, but still his teeth clench when he pulls the black tongue, tightens the lace, ties a bow, doubles the knot. On the ice, he shifts his weight, pushes hard, glides, slips his stick behind the puck, and with a flick of his wrist, sends it towards the net. He comes to a razor-sharp stop, winces, as he's engulfed by a swarm of back-slapping, helmet-bashing teammates. With a roar, the crowd rises as one in praise of his score and the ease with which he made it. And for my final poem, I do have to say that in retirement, I have learned a whole lot of stuff I didn't know before. I never knew that I would have anything more to learn. Um, I learned that the greatest gift of all is not love, although it's mighty wonderful. I learned the greatest gift of all is not world peace, although that would be wonderful too. So I wrote a poem about the greatest gift. Could it be the sun that rises each morning as if it had spent the night kneeling behind the mountain? Or is it the squirrel that gleefully lurches from feeder to feeder as if the seeds were put out for him. Or, in March, is it found underneath the snow, a crocus waiting, bound to a promise, the greatest gift of all, life. We'd like to thank you very much for coming out this beautiful evening. Thank you for this incredible room it's just it's just an amazing library very special to have this in vermont <laughs>